in, but we want to get underway. And um, for those of you who are interested, uh, Kansas City has a two to one lead. So, uh, <coughs> so let's, uh, let's get rolling. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce a very, very talented uh, architect, designer, Scott Erty. I'm not going to go deep into his resume, but I'm going to tie uh, a few things to Scott uh, based on our, our history uh, of knowing each other for a long time. I think we first met in uh, 1989 when we were both grad students at Syracuse University. Scott uh, came by way of uh, Ohio State University previous to that. And uh, um, from the minute I met him, I knew this was a very special uh, person because not only does he have an incredible uh, joy uh, for design, um, but uh, is an incredibly likable person. <laughs> and those of you who have met some very talented designers in your day realize that those two don't always run together, but they do in Scott's case. Um, this is a architect, an architect who is motivated by an unerring belief in modernism and the potential of modernism to uh, really to uh, help our lives, to help culture, um, to uh, advance um, society and to deal with uh, the issues of sustainability and so forth. Uh, I had the pleasure, Syracuse had an interesting um, kind of model when a student did their thesis, uh, a, so, so for instance, when Scott was doing his thesis, he ran a, an office. Um, so those last few weeks when you're doing your thesis, you had millions of people helping you draw your thesis. You had all the underlays done and then they would draw over those. <laughs> And I was one of those minions uh, helping Scott on an amazing project for a museum at Lockport, New York, which if you've never seen, you need to go see. It's where the Erie Canal uh, makes its way up the uh, Niagara Escarpment. And Scott recognized this, the beauty of this place, uh, this industrial past, and, and made a really fascinating project out of it. Um, in that time, though, at Syracuse, as I got to know Scott before the thesis, uh, I was heading off to Italy to study, and uh, he had been to Italy. He said, oh, you're going to love it. You're going to love Florence. Uh, come on in. Um, he says, uh, hey, when, you're, when you're there at the gardens at the Villa Rosa where they had their thing, be sure and check out the sculpture I did. So well, it turns out there was sculpture everywhere that Scott had done that were really amazing pieces and an exciting time. I bet he can't believe I remember that. Uh, a few years back, I had Scott come uh, when I was at the University of Arkansas to, to lecture about a very important project he had done at the time, the Southern Poverty Law Center, um, a, a uh, really breathtaking and uh, uh, I would say groundbreaking project in many ways. And uh, uh, I look forward to seeing uh, the amazing projects that have come since then and in fact have seen a few of them in person when I visited recently. Uh, the office in Philadelphia and went on a, a quick tour and Scott's going oh yeah that's we did this and we did that and all and there was a kind of uh, uh, you know just kind of oh yeah we did this little thing you know it's like the old uh, uh, you know something like out of uh, some movie where you know some little girl says when you tell them they have a really nice dress and they say oh this whole thing you know so he had that kind of uh, you know devil may care attitude about really, really great work, and I think you'll appreciate that. So uh, with that, probably my most informal introduction for a person who I consider very informal, Scott Erty. Thanks. Tim, that was a wonderful introduction, and it's not all true. Um, he did help me, but not as much as the other people at the school when we were drawing the thesis. <laughs> <clears throat> but, um, I wanted to say a couple things to start out with. I love to, to, I teach at the University of Pennsylvania. It's kind of like my hobby. I don't really have time to do it, and I don't think I do it very well, but I keep going back. But um, the one thing I wanted to impress on you guys as students is to always be a student. Um, I absolutely love to go to work every day. I've never worked a day of my life since I got out of school, even though we work very long hours um, and work very hard. 
But I wanted to impress on everybody that, that be a student all your life because that's really what's going to fuel your passion. And with that, you know, some of the, the things that you may not hear in that statement is to always really embrace the realities of building. There are so many talented students at Penn, for instance, other Ivy League schools that get out of school after designing these things which are incredibly imaginative and creative and they get very frustrated in the sort of the archaic notion of what practice is. And so I, I, I would implore you guys to really learn the realities of building and leverage those things to do great things uh, in the built environment. Um, take constraints and really leverage those to make things out of constraints. And sometimes you'll find that you can actually outwit a contractor or outwit a client <clears throat> if you in fact just do that by taking the constraints and making something out of them. So um, I won't jabber on too much because there are other events today that are going on that I, Tim and I will keep you updated on the score. So unless you, if you don't have a smartphone, you can't know the score yourself, we'll help you out with that. Um, the, the, the title is New Urban, and I, I thought about this because, you know, without really thinking about it as part of <clears throat> our, our, as an agenda, a lot of the projects that we do have this sense about a collective social consciousness within a building, something that tries to get people to interact socially better. Um, a lot of our work is urban, um, not all that you're going to see here is urban, um, but the idea of, of how you can really take um, cities which are becoming more and more populated, more and more people are living in cities, and how you can make buildings create a better social environment for people to get along. So <clears throat> enough about that, I'm going to start talking about some of the work and really talk about how you can do a couple of different things. Um, I'm going to do, make sure I know how to use the pointer. So we're going to look at some projects. Tim mentioned the Southern Poverty Law Center. I'm going to go over that really quickly. Uh, but I want to talk about this, and I thought for the students here, maybe some of the key points I'm going to try to hit, which is this idea of expanding the site. You guys are all assigned a project for studio. We're assigned projects as professionals. The idea of thinking about where the site is and expanding the boundaries of that. We're going to talk about how to manipulate program. We're going to talk about an environmental response that can become an aesthetic. So the idea of the decorative it doesn't really happen. It's really the expressive. Um, the idea of um, expanding a budget, when you have no budget for a project, how do you get more out of that? And then articulating a narrative in St. Aloysius, and then uh, structure serving the site in the Millennium Hall we're going to talk about. Evo, which is behind here, which is a tower which is almost complete in Philadelphia, and then our dairy barn. <clears throat> so when we first started the practice, I was at a big firm. I actually lived in Kansas City for a year, did this uh, uh, headquarters for a pharmaceutical company. Um, Herx, Mary, and Roussel out in, uh, in the south part of Kansas City. Um, and then from that went on to, to start a practice. And this was the first project that we worked on, the Southern Poverty Law Center. That clock is from the building that they were in when the Klan, the Ku Klux Klan firebombed their headquarters. And so when we became in contact with these folks, I was still at the, the old firm, and I was amazed about the passion that these people had for their work, right? I don't go to work in a Kevlar vest because people are going to take a shot at me, right? So for, for them to do things like that really impressed upon me uh, the importance of architecture. The big firm wasn't really interested in that project as much as I was. I ended up leaving it, fortunately went our way, um, so we were able to do that. But to talk about expanding the site, um, this is the building that we did right here. Wait a minute, sorry, still learning. So this is our building right here. This is this the Civil Rights Memorial that Maya Lin designed. This is the Alabama State Supreme Court. This is the state capitol. This is Dexter Avenue, where Rosa Parks initiated the bus boycott. Um, if you don't know what so the Southern Poverty Law Center does, they actually litigate against hate groups. So um, the Aryan Nation, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, all these white supremacist groups that, that really prey upon the uh, less fortunate, they actually go after them in civil court. So this project had a number of key monuments around it, but most particularly was the church where Dr. Martin Luther King first started preaching in public. So for me, this was like, this is like a banging student site, right? It's got everything, it's unresolvable, there's 25 feet of grade change across it, it's perfect assignment for a student. So the things that you think you're doing in class right now, you will get to do those things in your profession, so I really encourage you to do that. So if you look at the site, some of the things that we did was, there's the, the Civil Rights Memorial. We actually pushed the building back to create a quiet precinct for the building. Um, it really gives reverence to what happens here. This is the most visited tourist attraction in all of Alabama, um, in Montgomery there. 
And so we set the building back here and we created an axial relationship with the church. So there's this idea about the beginning of the civil rights movement and the end of the civil rights movement for many folks who actually gave their lives in that cause. So organizationally, we took that building and what we did was we placed all of the offices on the north side, north facing light. Um, this was actually before LEED was, uh, had taken hold, but it's all naturally daylit office space and we put all the offices to the south, I'm sorry, all the hard wall stuff to the south, so the, the stairs, the bathrooms, all these things that you don't really look out of the windows a lot. And we did that for a very specific reason was we wanted to protect the, sa the sanctity of that place, that memorial, so that you didn't get tired of looking at it. You didn't get used to seeing that, so that what would happen is by pushing this building back, we placed a couple of key rooms on that south facade, which are the libraries and the meeting rooms where they would actually come together to talk about what their mission is so that when you're actually come together and you look down and you see kids running their hands across the names of the people that died in the Civil Rights Movement, it has a much more powerful meaning. So here you see a view of that memorial that Maya Lin designed, uh, the building facade here, and then the church um, where Dr. King started preaching um, in public. So this idea about taking context and pushing out your idea of sight beyond your property lines is a very important thing that allows you to really leverage um, the site um, for a greater purpose. Um, some other things about the project, um, a lot of this thing is a very high security. This was designed to embassy standards. So what does that mean? It means that like this is actually a barrier so that a truck going you know, 25 miles an hour full of dynamite can't get past that point. There's a long ramp up to the entry where you will actually see somebody that's actually wanting to cause trouble um, before they get to the front door. So a lot of the things that were done in the building were done in a way that was really a defensible building. This is a view looking at night and you can see these libraries which really become symbolic of what the mission is of the center. So uh, Morris Dees and Joe Levin, the, the, the founders of the center, um, are very excited and, and continue to be excited about this project in terms of what it means to their mission. They were very clear when we first met with them that this building really had to embrace the qualities that they had and what they did, and it had to be a symbol for something better. And they also warned us that in Montgomery, Alabama, this was a real lightning rod. It really got a lot of attention, um, good and bad, for the center, um, all good architecturally, fortunately. So there's a view of the church um, looking back at the building. And when we talk about leveraging program or leveraging site, it's really about trying to make aesthetic out of that which does performative uh, function. So, for instance, the south or the north facade of this, um, it looks like it's kind of a, a decorative mosaic of glass, but that's actually intended um, to prevent people from tracking someone inside with a rifle. There's a tower about two blocks from here, and what that does is help it makes it more difficult for you to see somebody walking back and forth in there. So it's been a, a good project for us. It was one of our first um, projects that we did, and it's been a, a phenomenal success. Um, <clears throat> another project that we worked on, and this goes to this idea of leveraging program to do a social cause and to really make a place more interactive for its residents. So this is the Piazza at Schmitz. It's in Philadelphia. Um, we first started working with this client. He was the, had the worst reputation of anybody. He was a developer in Philadelphia. He basically did strip malls and, um, and movie theaters. And everybody, the first thing we did was we looked online and did a search on how many litigations there were between him and his architects who hadn't been paid. So that's a great lesson for you guys too. So love your work, live like you're still in school, but get a business partner who is, actually has an MBA as well if you're the design guy. So that's worked out well for us. My partner David McHenry um, actually has a master's of business administration in addition to an architecture degree. So anyway, back to this, this, this uh, site was a previously a brewery that he tore down one uh, Saturday evening when all of the, the city officials were not around. Um, but um, the idea of, of taking this site and leveraging it into something more is what we looked at. So we were actually brought into this project because there was a, a real pushback from the neighborhood. The neighborhood um, was a, an aspiring neighborhood that it was initially artists and they wanted to have a better design review. So they had a design review. They kept giving this guy a hard time and finally he said, what do I want to do? So they said, well, we've got to hire a different architect. So we met with him. And when we met with him, this was the plan that had been approved for zoning. So this was the approved plan. This is not our work here. So um, <clears throat> it's, it, what happened was this client went to, to Italy, Piazza Navona specifically, and he came back with a postcard and told his architect, I want me a piazza. <laughs> so the architect went to work, 
um, thinking about what a piazza means. And the, the architect thought the piazza was so important that he put the scale or the legend for the drawing right in the middle of that space. So that should be a clue. But what was even worse is this is what transpired after that conversation in the postcard. So the idea that this, this client who really has a terrible reputation, um, he needed someone to educate him. So what we did was we spent a lot of time with him educating him on, him on why that Piazza Navona was wonderful. It wasn't just the, the, the architectural aesthetic of its time period, but it was really the fact that it was really a gritty space where there was a confluence of traffic, pedestrians, retail, restaurants, residential. So it was really about zoning as much as anything. So this guy had wanted nothing to do with us when we first met with him. So he had a plan already in place. So what we did was we thought, what, we're going to outwit our client in this one because we know what his is important to him. And it's really about the performance of the building from a, an aesthetic standpoint, not an aesthetic standpoint, from a productivity standpoint. So this was his typical unit, about 1,000 square feet. And what we did was we analyzed that 1,000 square foot unit. So here you see two units uh, across a hallway here. And we did a little analysis for him. So basically, to serve two of those units, he's creating about 108 square feet, or about 10% add-on factor for his project. So when you're sitting in the studio and you're thinking about how beautiful something is, also think about how smart something is. Because oftentimes, out in the real world, the smart's going to get the beautiful to happen. So it's actually something, uh, you know, an ends to a, a means to an end. So what we did was we analyzed this for him and we said, look, if you think about taking that 10% or that square footage that you have in the two units and configuring it differently, what you get is an opportunity where you might actually think about doing townhouse units in a building that's served by a common quarter. So if we do this, basically that, that square footage that's just dedicated to the hallway actually goes from 10% down to 3%. So he's still not impressed yet. Um, with us, uh, but what we did was then we extra expanded this a little bit. So over that project that he already had approvals for, we could actually save about 36,000 square feet by going from the flats to the loss. So basically, there's some functional things that are better. There are fewer elevator stops, fewer hallways that you have to buy, build, and heat, and cool. But this is where he really sat forward, because at $200 a square foot, 36,000 square feet, equates to about $7.2 million in construction that he didn't have to spend. Or, better yet, if he put that into leasable space, i.e. more retail space, he could rent that for about $800,000 a year. So this is when this developer suddenly became interested in architecture. <laughs> so it's a good lesson because you got to know what the buttons are of any project. Any project has its own agenda that the sooner you figure that out, instead of being the creative genius uh, sitting you know, with your blinders on, look around your world and find solutions uh, that need to be taken place. Does anybody recognize the precedent for this, besides the faculty? <laughs> anybody? Come on. I'll buy a scotch for whoever answers. <laughs> She's cuter than you. What? <laughs> you say Corbu? Who said Corbu? Well done, well done. Uh, Corbu's unite uh, section. So basically, because I was paying attention in history, you know, you could draw on these models in terms of creating something for a modern day um, client. So basically, what happens with this unit is you come in, you have a living room space with a double height um, space here. You go in this unit, you have a small powder room overlook and then unit like this. So basically both of those units get views of the city and of the piazza in the middle. So for that it was really um, important because it had you know a lot of things. Now what we didn't tell him was our interest in this was instead of having two doors on every 36 foot a quarter, you now have six doors, right? So what does that mean? That means that you're going to see your neighbor more often, not just their trash out in front of their apartment. If you see your neighbor more often in your building, you're going to recognize them out in the neighborhood. So the idea that that can actually sponsor a better social interaction among the residents is what we were really excited about. So back to planning. So these are our plans for this. So some of the key things that we did as well, because we knew this guy was going to be nickel and dime in the project to death. So what we did was we looked at these units. So here's all the plans. So um, this is the quarter plan right here. So you go into this unit. This is the, the down unit. This one is the up unit. So what's really important about this is stacking all the plumbing, right? So what we did was we stacked all the plumbing such that we could actually flip these things left to right without any penalty. 
as it turned out, it actually was a great benefit because it saved more money because we didn't have all the toilets on one side and all the kitchens on another. What we were allowed to do is actually we downsized all the stacks and they all became the same five inch stack and they were all prefabbed and dropped down the shaft. So that saved another chunk of money that, that didn't even come out in our initial analysis. But what's really important about this is that bilateral symmetry of these units because it's a very repetitive plan. This is the space that's created between uh, the buildings now. Um, what we did was we broke the building apart a little bit differently than what he had planned, but we actually broke this apart. There's a great little one-story warehouse building from the turn of the century, so we sort of worked this thing to create a small little pocket park here, a little place for a restaurant. And then the end of this built block, which was not really addressed at all, we actually put 36,000 square feet into an office building there. So this is basically what we called his free building. So an additional savings that we did with that square footage was we created these social spaces. So not only did you see your neighbor more often, instead of modulating the quarter wider and narrower like a hotel does, we kept it a fairly tight quarter, and then we created these special spaces which are like semi-public lounges up in the building. So now these spaces are social spaces that the residents can interact in. And there's actually a guy that has every Tuesday, second Tuesday of the month, has a band up there, and they play it. So it's like this giant speaker in the building and it becomes like a, a drawing point for uh, the entire residence. So what's important about this is it's very um, inexpensive construction. One thing we've learned uh, long ago was to really leverage the construction typology in a way that it becomes the DNA for the project. So this is basically just block and plank, and it's just block. It's not special block, it's not nice block, it's pretty ugly block. And I remember him calling me on a Sunday, he's like, Scott, we gotta cut some money out of this thing. I'm like, the only thing you could do is get your concrete block at the Home Depot because that's the only thing that would be maybe marginally cheaper because it was already really inexpensive materials. These are all window systems, which are much less expensive than even storefront. Um, and what we were able to do was this facade. So you can see actually where you have a one-story bedroom and a two-story living room. You can see how those things don't align. That's by way of that doing, being able to flip the units back and forth. So here you see the building in its completed state. And what we wanted to do was kind of reaffirm the Philadelphia row house in a sort of a, a, a modern way where you really get a sense of the party walls of the condition of this and the modulation of the top and then the idea of these special spaces within the building. So at night when folks start coming home it's really a lantern of activity so it's really nice at dusk to see these lights come on as people come home and start turning on their lights going out on the terraces and so forth. Here's another view of that. You know in a building like this color inside a building is very tough to do because you know, nobody wants to decorate around some architect's wild dream about green. So what we did was we actually just painted the fronts of these balconies with the color. So that's basically all the color in the facade that there is. He, he was so happy with it, he threw himself a birthday party um, when we finished. And so he invited 3,000 of his friends that all came to, to, uh, to hang out in, at his party. And it was quite a party too. He had special lighting uh, going on. Um, you can see some other views of that, um, views of the facade. He had all sorts of things. His daughter is a fashion designer, had a lingerie show um, going on there. That's me calling my wife, telling her I'd be late. <laughs> <coughs> but um, for us, what we, we really wanted to do was create a place. So what I'm really excited, does anybody ever heard of the, the Philly rapper Diplo? Everybody ever heard of that? So the Piazza is on his latest EP, the cover of that. For me, that really tells us that culturally it's made a significant inroads to a younger generation of people. Um, the Piazza at Philadelphia, if you go to talk to anybody from Philly, they know where the Piazza is. It's a place that's really like the fifth square um, of Philadelphia. So that's really, for us, an exciting uh, thing. And then you see basically here the free building, which is we named the Rialto. I'm going to check the time here because I know we want to be done quickly here tonight. All right, all right. <clears throat> so this was his free building um, that he got 35,000 square feet based on his bulk zoning approved, already approved. So what's really exciting for us is that, you know, this guy sees value in this thing. So basically we did this building here, so it's basically he wanted an all glass building, right? Perfect for the environment. Um, <clears throat> so typically, you know, you have a centralized core. There's a, this, the views of the city were this direction, which on top of that, we offset the core so you get better views of the city. The trouble was the view of the city was also the view of the southwest sun, which is even doubly bad. Um, so what we did was we saw that as an opportunity 
to study the heat gain. So we brought it into Ecotech, we studied the facade of the building, where it got the most um, direct solar gain as well as bounce gain um, off the ground, and we used that as part of the way to think about the facade. So what we did was we, we looked at that and we charted it out, we used the three different glass types, which basically had a greater uh, shading coefficient the more, the more it got around to the south and southwest facade. So as it goes around to the north, it's almost completely clear glass. So the idea that when you look at this building, you know, it looks like an aesthetic sort of decision that we made, but what we hope in our work is that you could actually study that building, analyze it, think about it, and it would tell another story. So it might tell a story about its orientation. So for us, that's what, when I think architecture is really doing its job when it becomes interesting, and hopefully it becomes like a great novel where you read it and you understand more and more about the characters the more you look at it. So not that we've gotten there yet, but I hope that someday I'll do a building that can sustain that kind of analysis where people go back and they study and they find out more things about it. Um, <clears throat> Independent Small Cafe, this, we were very fortunate to do on the National Mall in Philadelphia, um, the, the cafe basically is for tourists to get ice cream and stuff, right? So this was a big competition with all the big firms in town. We were just a little, little wee little firm at the time. And we were able to compete um, to win this. So basically it sits, um, here's where the Liberty Bell is now. It used to be sitting here. This Mitchell Jurgula, really awesome modern building which was erased and, and created this really neo-historical stuff over here. This is the National Constitution Center by IMP. Uh, this is Independence Hall. So, the, the project site sits right here, which is like a pretty big deal for a young firm to do. So Lori Olin did the master plan, so in that master plan it was basically this soft edge here, a uh, hard edge of buildings along there. So what we did was we sort of thought about that thing and thought about this as a pavilion in the park. What's really interesting about the project is that it looks like it sits on the ground, but it actually sits on multiple layers of stuff. Um, so basically this is a section which shows how complicated your life can get. So this is Lori Olin's new tablet of, of landscape, which required a six foot deep concrete grid in order to hold it, because it's over top of an, a Pico electrical substation. Um, so we basically had the, the National Park Service, the city of Philadelphia to deal with, the, the electric utility, but the very worst one was the Philadelphia Parking Authority, because they were like underneath us as well. So we couldn't do much at all, we had to like talk to everybody about every little time we touched down there. So for us, this little pavilion became very complicated. Architecturally, they had about $800,000 to do a union project in Philadelphia, which pretty much makes sure you get approvals. I mean, it's a very heavily union town, but the idea of $800,000 for a, a public building like this is very little money. So what we decided to do was to really create almost like an open park structure. So we basically created a diner for ice cream. So the idea that this is really an open air pavilion which doesn't require air conditioning, doesn't require heating, and we use the glass walls on the outside actually to temper that. So this is the outside of it with the windows closed, and you can see this one's open here. The idea that these can open up, and it actually creates like a windbreak, so in more temperate seasons it goes across. So here it is, there's Independence Hall um, in the distance. So basically this thing opens up and becomes like an open air pavilion. So the park service, actually our biggest ally in this were the park rangers with the hats. Um, they were actually our biggest advocate because when we talked about using core 10 steel, these guys knew all about it. Yeah, we use that all the time. You, know, you don't have to paint it, right? So we're thinking this is great. So now the board of directors of the, of the um, Independence Mall could see something that was red like brick, stacked up like brick, just giant pieces of it. Um, and really then it actually had a nice warm color that you can see here in terms of it looking sort of very Philadelphian, but it's a reinterpretation. Here you see the idea of those panels. So the, the genius move, and I will tell you that it was not planned this way, but I will tell you it's a genius move now, is that we couldn't afford air conditioning for this building. So all summer long, the glass is wide open, right? Had we been able to afford air conditioning, you know the first warm day that would have been solid and closed. Um, so that worked out well in terms of creating a place for, for uh, people to go to. And I did fail to mention that what it really does is it pulls you to the edge of the park and frames a view. On the other side of this is the cemetery on the other side of the street where Ben Franklin is buried. So the idea that this thing really frames some context that's off-site is what the, the goal was we were trying to do. <clears throat> so another thing that, that is really fun for us is to articulate a narrative. 
Um, we were fortunate enough to do St. Aloysius Church in Jackson, New Jersey. Um, and when we first met with the congregation, these people had no idea who St. Aloysius was. I didn't know who St. Aloysius was, but his life and all that. So we started asking them about who was St. Aloysius. And we'd done our homework, and we found out he was, he was the, the son of a wealthy landowner in northern Italy. He had everything coming to him. He was going to have a life of luxury. Um, but then when he was like 15 years old, he said, Dad, I think I want to become a Jesuit. And so his dad, like, what are you talking about? You got like everything. So he ended up helping the poor, ended up dying of the plague because of his sort of uh, uh, compassion and willingness to help someone else. So we wrapped this story around the building and we worked with the congregation. So suddenly these people that were going to church and writing their check, the only way they knew is because they wrote St. Aloysius a check every week, right? That's the only connection that they had. So what we did was we helped articulate that narrative. And what we did was we tried to understand what his life was about. So in our research, we found he basically had four devotions in his life. He had the, the Blessed Sacrament, the Passion, Our Lady, and the Choir of Angels. So what we did was we organized this building about those four different aspects and, and put chapels around those. <coughs> Excuse me. In addition, we had this notion of repitching the tent, kind of an Old Testament notion where you pitch the tent for God's presence. Um, and so we basically, you know, pitched the idea of pitching a tent. Congregation loved it. Um, everyone's all excited, getting excited. And we're like, how in the hell are we going to build this thing? Right? So I, I shouldn't say I was a church, but how would, might we build this thing? Um, so, so this was what, what we were thinking about. We had no idea how we were actually going to build this crazy shape. So one of our young interns, right out of school, she was my thesis student, Christy Ballier, um, she actually did some research and found this guy, Dan Tully, who was a retired structural engineer out in Arizona. So he has a, he has a patented formula for this parabolic uh, roof system, which is basically this. So it's, it's basically two layers of plywood, and then we actually put the decorative wood on the bottom. So basically, here's the thing. This, the fabricator hadn't built one of these since the 70s, and they're getting ready to rip out all this formwork. And so we have these guys in upstate New York build this. But basically, the solution to a cheap roof was these layers of plywood that were glued together and then cut apart for transport. So <clears throat> this is that roof system. So the idea about your technology courses that you're taking now that like, is always getting in the way of your studio class, right? Structural class is always in your way of studio class. Going to a lecture is always in the way of studying for something else or the Royals game or whatever. But the idea that you know, what you learn in school is very important, and it can, you, it can imply to things in very unexpected ways. So for us, it became really the touchstone of this project was this roof, this idea of creating a place, a calling place, uh, for everybody to get together. So here it is, um, fully constructed, um, this idea that this soft form really captures space between the ground and the sacred space of the, the top. So you can see the, uh, here you go, some of the, the Places. This is the beginning of the Passion. There's St. Al over there. This is Our Lady. So there's a little chapel. We, we commissioned a sculpture of, our, of a pregnant Mary that goes in there. And then there's the, the other chapel here. So the idea that those things actually become a narrative that people tell the, each other about. So they talk about that with the, their friends at, 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 when they go to the church. <coughs> Millennium Hall at Drexel. Um, so this is a project, this was our first tall building that we did. We haven't done a lot of tall buildings, we've only done two, so this is one of two. Um, and so um, when we went after this, we weren't actually invited to compete for it, so we kind of figured out a way to worm our way into competition, and we knew it was going to be tough, so um, I reached out to Cecil Bauman, who was at the time the director at um, Arup, who was, you know, if you know about his work, he's a, a very famous structural engineer. Um, so we teamed with him on this project to do something for Drexel, which is primarily a, a school um, based in engineering. Um, so we ended up winning that project, and the problem was that they wanted to basically build 500, put 500 students on three tennis courts. And their typical model was really this big, squat, fat building, <coughs> which we had done one for them already. Um, and we explained to the president that they basically have little space. One of my classes that I taught at Penn, we did student housing. And um, everything all right? Oh, thanks, Tim. He's always looking out for me. He's like, we can't do anything to slow Scott down. Just got to put gas in the car. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Tim. That's delicious. Um, 
So basically, we talked to, talk to them about doing something taller. University of Pennsylvania has about 180 students per acre. Um, I'm not sure what K-State is per acre, but I bet you that you guys have probably like 45 students per acre, something like that. I'm guessing, uh, let's see, uh, different colleges around Philadelphia, we studied a bunch of them. Drexel has like 490 students an acre, right? So very dense, right? So the idea of where we're going to house us, so that's how we talked to them about doing a tower. Um, the other thing that they did for this competition was they wanted a building um, that was very cheap. So we sort of mapped out sort of different projects that we worked on, what it cost per bed to build. Like 68,000 bucks was the average cost. Um, the, what they wanted, their, the average cost about $217 a square foot. <clears throat> they basically had a budget of $32.5 million for 500 beds, which meant it was only $65,000 a bed, which is at the lower end of cheap buildings, not a high rise on a very tight site. So we actually leveraged this aspect to do something interesting. Um, the only variable we could change was really the square foot per student. So what we did was we did a very compact plan and we laid this thing out such that it created a social sensibility to the building. So basically at each end of the corridor, there's actually student spaces that's either a media lab or a study lab. The idea that this thing connected it with the community at the ground floor and then the city at the top <coughs> was what we wanted to do. So this is where Cecil Bauman came in and his true genius. What we wanted to do was actually let this building twist so it looked to the city. So if you're standing here being very conscious of the street grid and the city's over there, the building kind of has to twist like that. So we thought this would be a great idea, do something interesting with the, with the program. So that's a fantastic view that you get from this building. We're actually just won a project where we're going to do a building right here, which will block 90% of the view of this building. <laughs> <clears throat> but that's okay, because we'll talk about how much better it would be to live in this other building. So um, what we did was we respected the street grid um, with the building, so it's primarily orthogonal. And then we basically did a building which had a, a core in the middle and then two rows of columns. So the building is basically two rows of columns. And what was really interesting about that is because they're an arch in plan, so imagine an arch in plan that goes up, that's very good for, for resisting lateral wind loads, the sail effect on the broad side of the building. So that was a fantastic uh, solution, I thought. Again, the studies at the two ends, the idea that we wanted the building to rotate, and then because I paid attention in school, um, they told me that we couldn't really rotate elevators and stuff like that. So, I, I, I learned from that. But what we did was we actually fixed the central elements of the building and then let the plan go up each floor. So basically there's 10 inches of rotation on every floor as that structure goes up. So basically there's no penalty for the construction. And the, the contractor, once he finished freaking out, realized that basically he's still got to move those forms every time. Every time he's got to move them anyway. So he's still got to measure where they go. And if we gave him measurements for every place they go, He's like, well, you know, I guess you're right. It doesn't really cost more. So that was how we, we got this to happen. <clears throat> this is a, uh, a construction photograph that shows the building going up with a glass curtain wall uh, in place. This, the elevator is still there. Um, so there's that, the building. So basically this thing spins and kind of rotates, and it's got curtain wall at the end where those lounges are um, at the two ends. Here it is under construction. But what's really fantastic is that you know, this was one project that if it ever like stopped before it was finished, I would have loved it because this thing was just amazing before it was clad because all of those rooms cantilever from those central columns. So as soon as you step into your room, you're in a cantilever. The entire rooms are cantilevered. And that actually worked well to balance out that load because we had the arching factor of the floor plan. So here's what it looks like um, built. There's one of the rooms. There's the top view of the city. Um, there's the columns that you see in the bottom, view from the city. And then like little things like this, um, you can see some of these folds in those columns. Everybody know what the slenderness ratio is? Another drink for somebody. Not you, Tim, you taught, taught structures. Nobody? <clears throat> so when you have a column and it's tall and thin, right, it, it's very weak, right? So it has to get fatter and fatter unless you brace it. So what we did was, we created these folds in those columns. You can see some of them here, here, that actually give them strength. So you guys know from just folding paper that that gives it a lot more strength. And it's some kind of little piece of architecture that tells a story about what it does. Um, so here you can see the building cantilevers out from those two corners um, all the way up. 
great view. One, there's one of the study lounges packed full of students studying. And a view of the building um, complete. Um, Evo Philadelphia, so this is our tallest building we've done. It's like 35 stories, and it freaks me out that people let us do this. <clears throat> because I gotta tell you, like, you know, I've done projects in school of different scale, I've done projects in practice. Doing a building this tall is very difficult. And it was, it was difficult in the sense of, you know, wrapping your head around it. You know, I've, I've gotten better at, you know, keeping a program in my head. But when you get this big, it's, it's very, um, very difficult. Um, so how do we make this building something special, right? So this idea, again, back to, this is Penn's plan for Philadelphia, where he created these parks um, in the four corners of the, of the city, and then the city hall sat in the center. We wanted to take that and really think about how a city works, right? The idea that these are the living rooms um, of the people in the city. So the idea that in a tall building, again, they can be very lonely places because everyone rides the elevator, everyone goes to their room, opens their door, and it's over. So what we want to do is somehow figure out a way to enhance the social life at a different scale um, within our building. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've done some studying with these guys about how to really position this building in terms of where this thing led to in terms of transit. So this isn't really a, a, a graduate housing for Penn or Drexel. It's a graduate housing for anybody that wants to actually live there. So looking at the site um, uh, more critically, you can see the, uh, the parks that Penn planned in there and the idea that the location of the building on the other side, really outside the city according to uh, William Penn's plan. Uh, but the other thing that we did was there's this enormous parking garage which sat next to it. So studying where this thing sat relative to the universities I think was an interesting uh, endeavor because really it helped them market this building to a number of, of folks because Penn and Drexel were losing their graduate students to Center City um, living in apartments. So the idea of maintaining kind of a university identity was important to Drexel and Penn. So this is the existing site um, right here um, next to the old post office. This is the train station when you go to Philly. You're going to come out of the train station right here. Uh, you can see the site. Um, the building sits underneath a railroad yard. So these are all the rail lines coming into 30th Street Station, which is here. Um, there's our project site. Here it is a little bit closer. And back to the idea of Penn's plan, um, what we were able to do is um, work with the owner um, to create a park on top of that. So here are the railroad lines which cut through half of our building. So in case you think that's not a big deal, I'll show you some pictures of why it is a big deal. And then the idea of um, what happens on top of that ugly garage, you know, so you're not looking down on it from the residential. <clears throat> that's the ugly garage. Um, these are the tracks. They go all the way underneath our building. That's our site for our building right there. Looking down into our site, um, very small. Um, so what we did with the building was we really wanted to respond to a couple of things. This is what's called the cocoon. Those are where the tracks are. Um, and then there's an elevated 30th Street station. Penn is in this direction, so we basically talked about this base form and moving this thing in such a way that it actually did a couple of things where it actually lifted up to create a more porous ground floor, excuse my spelling, um, and then a view to the city in this direction. So the idea that the building had context in a longer position, which led to this building. Um, so this is the building nearly finished, and it's still nearly finished um, because we sourced the curtain wall from Jangho, America, which is actually uh, fabricated in China, shipped to Mexico to be assembled, taken over to California, and then shipped across country. And that's still cheaper than building it in the USA, unfortunately. Um, so again, the idea of what this building was about was, if you go back to Penn's plan, what we did was we planned these social spaces in the building. So there are these double height living rooms which really act as neighborhood um, centers all the way up the building. So it works itself in the ground floor all the way up through the building and then up to a community room on the top. So how do we do that? So we worked in the, um, we would use Revit now and we basically early on started using this where we can map out these unit types. So each of these colors are unit types. And we looked at thousands of manipulations of how those things could be put together in order to create open space. So what we ended up finding is, you know, by creating more four bedroom units, which were more efficient, we could create these public spaces. This is blah, blah, blah stuff about yield and all that. Like we, we would send these hourly to the client in Charlotte because they wanted to know what the yield was every moment. Um, so those are some of the things that we did um, there. So they were a great client in terms of embracing this idea of a social um, aspect of the building. 
So here's the building. Um, you can see the double height living rooms that, that exist in the building. Uh, what we did was we looked at the base form. Oh, here, this is a good uh, indication. So that truss work actually helps span the tracks which actually go below. So what we did was we shaped this building to hide all the mechanical junk up here and really open it up for a view of the pool from the pool of the city beyond. So there it is in its final form. The mouth opens up towards Penn. The head gets ripped off to face the city. And then there's this whole series of um, lounges that, that happen within that. So here's that curtain wall of that, which shows really basically those lounge spaces, um, the entry space and the tracks below. Hidden behind here, this, this becomes a very zigzaggy of columns, which is really cool. Um, we worked um, on the curtain wall. There's a ceramic frit on it. I won't go into it because the Royal Games on. Um, but some of the renderings of the views from throughout the city. Um, views. Oh, so this is the, the, we were fortunate enough to be able to do this park on top of that garage. So this is like over an acre and working with uh, Brandywine, which is the developer, fabulous developer, right? Really cares about public space. So we actually designed a public park on top of that, which is connected directly to the ground. So the idea that this is going to be an amazing place to look back and see the city is just going to be a wonderful component. So here you see it with our building um, here, um, the roof deck here, which is the primary social space of the building. Now all these units look down on this incredible park. Um, and then we sort of folded that thing up so it's like bleachers so you can kind of sit on the hill and look across at the city. And that's almost complete in construction. Now uh, Cesar Pelli is designing a FMC tower here, which will completely block our view to the south. But he'll have a great view of our, of our roof terrace. So here's, um, here's the view um, of the city um, from up on the roof. So really it creates, a, it creates another ground plane. And you can see that the interaction that happens there is very visible to these folks. And we created some uh, lanai units, which actually have outdoor, you know, doors to the outdoors um, from their apartments. So they have this big, great backyard. Um, the front has retail, opens up towards Penn. Um, complicated little thing was we had to be this high up over top of the rail line for whatever reason. Um, so we basically put retail up there. So there's this grand stair that goes up to retail, which is in the sea of columns, which is, uh, goes across into our space and creates a big stair on the inside. Some different views of that. So you can see that retail space, which has a terrace um, up on top. So basically the idea of, of that facade and those holes, um, going at that you know, from an architect standpoint, you can see this is the lowest floor of that. So you can see the column configuration that had to happen um, because of those rail lines. Um, and then what you see, the lobby here, and this is the, the column grid of residential. So those things completely don't work, right? So everybody's like, oh, this is a terrible thing. We got to do something crazy like that. I'm like, this is a fantastic opportunity. Because of that, nobody bitched at all about how much money we spent on that. <laughs> so what's really cool is that these aren't wide flange beams, although they are. These, this is actually the rebar for that truss. So the idea that all this is the tensile component of the truss, right? The rest of it's concrete. So even though it looks like a steel truss, all these studs that actually are on there bind that together so it's like a composite construction. So it's really, I think, really cool. So if you look at that, very complicated math here, um, but the idea of, of how that truss works um, just to really take care of that shift in the curving rail lines that go over our building. So it's a really you know, exciting thing um, that happens. <clears throat> I'll take you on up. So this is the lobby. You come in up to that retail space that looks at the city, um, the concierge level. And this is the typical floor. So you can see the core comes up. Um, you have units here. And you basically are within a couple of floors of one of these lounges. And a little trick, too, that we sort of stumbled upon was um, trying to articulate that facade in a way that made it both beautiful from the outside but also functional. We created these inverted bay windows. So when you stand there, you can actually see down the facade. So like a bay window works, you're actually out in front of the building. In this case, it actually opens itself up so you can actually see down and see the city. So what, this happen what happens with this is you can really actually see the city from that very uh, sharp, acute angle. Um, so here's one of those spaces. There's the view of the city. And what we did with these spaces, again, because we're basically a one-trick pony, um, we used the idea of, of, of a hybrid of Corbu's unite section to actually un unify public space. So basically what you have is three, un three quarters of apartments which face on these public spaces, which now link you know, three floors together. So it's kind of an interesting thing. You can stand there and look completely through the building. 
And then you get up to the very top and we basically created this lounge space with a pool. And uh, something I learned um, when I was, uh, I was fortunate enough to study at Oxford for a semester and I learned about the British ha-ha, which some people know. Somebody here might know what a ha-ha is in gardening, right? So it's that, it's basically a, a, a landscape move where the ground slopes slowly like this and goes up to a, a, a sharp thing and it basically keeps the, <clears throat> the sheep from crapping on your lawn of the main house. But the reason they're called a ha-ha is because you can't really see them from the other direction. So if you're not paying attention, you fall over the wall and everyone goes ha-ha at you. So anyway, but that's a long story for not a good reason. But what, <clears throat> what we did was a little bit of a ha-ha here where we actually stepped this thing down so that the railing around the top of this 35-story building um, is very depressed. And it's another trick from uh, Palazzo Medici at, at uh, Boboli Gardens, right? They, they have that amazing rail that when you stand up there, all you see is the Duomo. You don't really get a sense of the railing. So again, like architectural history is a very important thing. And there's a little uh, fitness center there. Um, so if you look at the building, um, the top floor of this thing, I'm not a postmodernist and, and did not necessarily want to do a cornice, but found a very good way to sell something very interesting to our clients, which was this is how you wash the windows. There's basically, they throw a line over this thing, it drops all the way down to the hole in the garage and they pull the basket up. And we found this gantry thing that sort of rolls around that thing like a little jungle gym up and down to clean the windows. So it's, it makes it kind of a cool cornice, I thought, on that building. So here's the, uh, the public uh, or the fitness center here. If you cut this thing back, you see the fitness center, the lounge space, the pool area. Cut a little bit further, you actually see the pool. And so that lower deck is about four feet down. So when you're standing here, the railing is really down from you. And then <clears throat> I, don't, I didn't point it out on that Drexel building that's, that had this sort of rotational thing, but the, the top of that building is really horrible. Um, and it was for my naivete as an architect thinking that if you draw where the mechanical stuff is and everybody designs the mechanical stuff, it'll all fit where it's supposed to. It never does. It never does. And so that's why I didn't point it out, but there's mechanical stuff that looks horrible everywhere on that building. So I was not going to be outsmarted again, so I created this giant 45-foot deep hole that they can just have at it, right? You just keep filling it up with mechanical stuff, and I dare you to poke it up above there. Well, they actually did. Um, <laughs> I'll show you. Um, that's a picture I took with my iPhone last week. It's almost done. That's the lounge. So here it is. So they actually did because the elevator overrun now pokes up just a little bit. So we had to do like a hood scoop like on a, uh, like on a hot rod where you sort of bump it up for the uh, air intake carburetor. So it's kind of cool. I think it's kind of cool. So, so here you see the pool. This is the, the, the lounge area. The pool has a little waterfall edge. Steps here, you can see the city. A little place you can put your feet there. Um, we're about ready to put water in the pool. I think if we wait a couple more weeks, we can hand out ice skates with it. But it's a little bit um, behind schedule. But it's a wonderful space. And so looking back from the pool towards the lounge, um, you get that. And then looking the other way towards the city, you get this. So you see that ha-ha edge there. So it's really, it's really freaky when you're up there because really the city really comes towards you. And it's really, it's really magical. And this is another iPhone picture from last week um, without water in it. So <clears throat> they just got the decking and you can see the edge of the pool. Uh, the rail comes around um, like that. View from the city. Um, and another thing that was like an, an accidental um, find on our part is that operable windows. We were working with Front, who is a curtain wall consultant out, in, out of uh, Brooklyn. Very good consultant. And then we were working with them on the curtain wall. And it's a lot cheaper to put operable windows in a building instead of having it be mechanically ventilated. You know, it's a nicer thing, but it's also cheaper. So that's a good thing to remember. And then what's, what's even cooler is if you have a building, which this, this is only 40% vision glass, because that's what the energy code requires, right? So this building is vision, you know, it's not all clear glass. So we worked this frit pattern, a bunch of stuff, and then we decided to put the windows in one of the solid panels, right? So those, all those things are actually solid panels, which open to create the ventilation. So you get in addition to your window, you get another place um, that's ventilated. And I'm very happy with the fact that, you know, as students are, most will leave the windows open year round um, because it's a very nice texture on the facade. And then there you can see one of those bay windows which allows the view of the city. Um, and then this is the lobby where you see those columns crashing down. <clears throat> this really mitigates between where the column wants to be 
um, for the trains versus where the column wants to be for the housing. So it's a very exciting, dynamic thing, which for me is, you know, it's purpose built. And no one ever, you know, you try to do this because you think it's going to be cool, like your Toyo Ito or something, right? At most practices, that doesn't fly well, right? So you've got to figure out a way that, you know, you're not going you know, to tell them you're Toyo Ito. You're going to say that you're just a problem solver, right? So we're just solving problems here and saving you money. So this is what we got to do. So it's kind of uh, an interesting thing. Uh, there's the building. Um, there's the building at night. It's not on fire. That's just a bad shot. <laughs> um, and last project, how are we doing on time? Can we can cancel the last project? All right, one more. So um, this is a, a dairy barn that we did um, for Cornell, and we were very um, humbled to be on the cover of Architectural Record. So who would have thought you do all these projects and you think, like, yeah, this is going to be the one that's, like, really good? And so it's a dairy barn, right? <laughs> and so, you know, it's full of cow shit. It's full of, you know, all, you know it's, it's, what's really exciting, though, is it's all about purpose. It's all about its function. And it's a, it's a, it's a teaching university, so it also teaches kids how to do, you know, veterinary medicine on large animals. So really it has to act as a functioning dairy barn, but then it wanted to also be a piece of architecture. So Gilbert Delgado, the university architect who hired us, you know, put us in this very precarious situation where his office, like, this is the gateway to campus. The trustees want a great building. And Dr. Gard, who's the head of the veterinary medicine program, just like, I just want a dairy barn. Can you guys just stop with all the architecture, right? <laughs> I just need a dairy barn. I could have had this thing seven years ago. So we worked with him very closely and turned out to be our, he turned out to be our biggest advocate because we listened. Um, so anyway, so I'll make this really quick. So we looked at the natural topography. This thing is a lot of, uh, part of a larger progress, uh, program for managing the watershed down to the creek that's not on the page here. But we looked at where the natural drainage swells were, and then we looked at um, where the ridge lines were for this. And then we designed the building, let's skip over here, in a way that it's all naturally ventilated. So the, you know, in LEED you have to save, I think, like 20% over the normal building condition. Farmers are already a hell of a lot smarter than most architects, right? They already understand this. This building basically, as a prototype, uses very little electricity. It's naturally ventilated, naturally daylit. So we had to work very hard to get a LEED um, rating. So we basically mapped out where the winds were, how they came at the building. We used that information to plot out our building. <clears throat> so basically the building follows the ridge line, and um, basically because the building is full of liquid manure, the whole building has to slope like 2%. So if you've never done accurate drawings of your projects yet, that will, probably doesn't mean as much to you as it does practicing architects. Everything is like a little bit out of kilter. Um, so the way we designed this thing was, that there's a classroom which we put on the second floor which is on axis with where all the students come in, come around and park here um, or the bus drops them off. So the idea that the, the, the classroom space is on an actual location and it actually overlooks the entire barn. So if you look at the components of the barn, um, basically that, that um, classroom space is on axis here and it's over top of the milking parlor. So this is where the cows come in to be milked. Absolutely, they love it. Um, students can look down on it, they can come in and walk through. There's also a bypass lane so students can go to the, the space here which is actually the special needs barn. So if there's a, an animal that needs special care and then the silage is here. So the idea of how this thing works, it's all about cow flow. So basically the green is the in, the purple is the out, the cows come up, they line up. As soon as they know it's milking time, they're all excited, they get in line, want to run up there. Um, and basically the feed goes this way. So something I hadn't considered is, you know, you really don't want to stomp in the tray that you're eating, the trough you're eating in, right? So basically the way that flow works is all the clean stuff goes through here when the truck drives to, to feed the, uh, the cows. Um, it doesn't really cross the manure lane until it's going outside the building. So this is the manure lane. So all this stuff slopes down here, slopes down here, and it's collected in uh, what is the, basically a big latrine there. Um, the, the natural wind pattern, based on our analysis, really shows how it takes the air across the animals. Um, and, and the thing that's really nice for me is like Dr. Gard and his people are saying like, there's no odor in this building and they never see a fly, which is atypical in a, in a dairy barn. And that has to do with the, the ventilation of the building. So it actually functions um, very well. There's all this stuff together because it kind of looks cool. So we work with Brian Haynes, a great landscape architect. This is all sort of different types of, of, 
of plantings that, that actually um, take the storm water. Uh, a couple different views of that, another view of that. Here's the inside of the barn, prefabricated trusses, the idea of how air flows over this. There's the feed lane that comes through. Um, looking at, so the classroom is there, so actually from the classroom you can look over and see kind of on the oblique the entire operation of the dairy barn. That's the milking parlor there. It has its own um, curtains that open. There's the milking part. Some that, like, we, we learned, right? So cows hate to stand on a hill sideways, right? If, if, if there's a hill, you'll never see a cow standing perpendicular to it because they'll fall over, right? So what happens is when the cows come in, because this thing is on a hill to go up to be milked, they all sort of line right up. It's amazing to watch. So they all line up, and then this thing drops down, just gives them a little scoot and a bum to make sure they all kind of get their business happening. Um, so it's a freestall barn, so basically the cows can uh, sleep wherever they want to, so they just go in there. This is a sand bed, keeps them very dry, very healthy. Um, it's designed at a perfect dimension, so the rear quarter, the rump roast, if you will, hangs over this. This is the, the manure lane, which then is scraped. Um, so it basically stays very clean. The cows are actually very healthy because of this. You know, for us, um, the average cow, I think, puts out like 60 pounds of milk a day, these cows are putting out 90 pounds of milk a day, right? It has a lot to do with the environment um, that exists in there. So there's a happy cow there. Um, there's the building. Um, <clears throat> so for us, um, the exciting thing about this was to really articulate a program in a way that could speak to the farmer, right? Because a lot of the local dairy farmers come here to be trained or to have interaction with the university, and the students go here. So they had to be in a, an environment which they could expect in the real world while making sure it was sort of a, an example to them uh, how things could be done better through daylighting, through orientation, um, things like that. So here you see it's used a lot for um, student groups going through. And the idea that this is really an assemblage of, of different components um, that really speak to their function, but also towards a sense of beauty. So for us, it's not really beautiful unless it functions well. So thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Tim, what's the score? Still 10 to 1, bottom of the six. All right. That was my question. Any questions? I'd be happy to answer. Perfect. All right, fantastic. Uh oh, I almost got out of here. Yes, sir. Yes. So is, how is that, is there any adjustment being made to that building in regards to your building, both the south face of your building and its solar access, as well as the solar access that's necessary to keep that green roof healthy? Are, are any adjustments being made to that building or actually, are they under no obligation? No, actually, Caesar Pelli is the master plan architect for all the buildings. So when we were designing our building, we met with them and showed them what we were doing. They were actually in design of that building. Um, if you look at it in plan, it's kind of a football shape, which helps that solar angle. So it was actually all done. When we did our wind tunnel study test, we had their shape already so we could put it in to, you know, to test that. So it's, it's not as grim as I made it sound. Um, so it, you know, it's actually, you know, there's going to be residential in that building that, that looks at, at the park and has access to the park. So it's actually going to be a very nice uh, space to be in. Hopefully rivaling the Piazza, our hope would be that if we could pull it off, we got two spaces that are places you people know about in Philly, like I'll meet you in Philly at the Piazza or the Sierra Sky Green would, would make me very happy. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, we met with, uh, with Captain Gallagher, who was the uh, fire marshal. We met with him several times about the building, and he, we would say, this is how this thing works, and here's what, he'd be like, ah, ah, ah. and then finally it hit him, he was like, ah, I see what you guys are doing, right? And then he understood it, right? So, so basically, it's a common path of travel issue. When, once you go in your unit, that is added to your common path of travel before you get to a point where there's two exits. So you just have to have that accounted for in your calculation. So 
<clears throat> because, you know, it's sort of a, a, another floor. I was afraid that we were actually going to create a, a space you couldn't get to. Because it's actually quite, when you, you know, as an idea, it's pretty simple, but when you add a stair, the elevators, and you have a stair stopping short and all that, we, there were actually some Trinity units in there that are three stories. You go on the middle level, which were quite nice. And a couple of people from, from our office have lived there. And when it first opened, they knew where the cool units were because the people leasing had no idea. They're like, I like unit 114B. I'm like, why do you want that one? There's no reason. You know, <laughs> because it was over the stair, it actually had an extra study. They, they didn't understand it, but it's, um, it worked out well. I mean, the, the thing you have to be careful with that is you do have to create a type B bathroom on the entry level, right? If you, if you, those of you who are very keen probably noticed there's not one. Philadelphia, when we did that, had its own accessibility board, so it was not a requirement to do that. So actually, we, when you do that now, you actually have a type B on the ground floor as well. So we're trying to get it done on another project right now in Philly, but that always creates a problem on a one-bedroom or two-bedroom apartment where one bathroom is down there. So you have to, you have to be more clever about because no one's going to spend a bathroom, just money on a bathroom just because it's cool. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked earlier in the lecture about extending the site. Mm -hmm. I know that there's some pretty exciting things happening on the eastern edge of the Schuylkill River mm -hmm. on the opposite side of the Right. Street. Did your client see the school of banks and the boardwalk or some amenities for the residents of the building? And what kind of relationship does your building have to the riverfront? Well, our building right now has a relationship where there's like 15 tracks between us and the riverfront with, can't, with uh, high voltage cantonary wires above it. So ours is not so much a direct relationship, it's more uh, because we're, we're in that kind of d dimension, we're on top looking over that to the Schuylkill Banks. And our client is actually one of the people involved in that Schuylkill Banks project. So they, they are very active in that. And so we've, we actually, I didn't show it, but we mapped out sort of passageways. Like for instance, Penn Park is to the south which connects to the Schuylkill Banks across the South Street Bridge. And our building actually allows you to come into our building from that lower level. That's where we put the bike room. And then you can come up into the building and then onto that terrace. So there's, there's an interaction with, I just didn't really show it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Yes, sir. The, that's a great question because the way we've had the most success in it is when we're on, part of a design build team. Like, like for instance, right now we're doing, we're renovating the School of Design at Penn and we're doing this fabrication up the front. It's got this kind of crazy rhino generated um, scrim pattern on it and stuff like that. And so we, the contractor gets all wigged out when we talk to the fabricator, right? Without him there, his permission and you know, all that. In that case, it's very difficult. But when we're like working on a design build project, like the, the, the Drexel Tower, the one that's curved, that kind of spins, <clears throat> we had a great relationship with that contractor where we had access to the subcontractors when we were designing. So for instance, we were sharing files with them to the fabricate those panels. So I didn't talk about it, but the in and out of all those panels, which is like impossible to get anything beyond like a three quarter inch relief on anything, right? So because we were meeting with the contractor, sharing our drawings, you know, you talk to them and they say, look, here's my issue. You're like, I don't want to waste material. I don't want to do this. I don't want to actually work. So we size all those panels based on standard sheet sizes. So that return of the fold equates to the extension out. So those are, there's no waste in those panels. So he saw that, much like the concrete guy saw that. So if we're able to share our work with them um, earlier and get an, an idea of how they fabricate, it's much better. And, and you know, the idea of I think it's really a, like a bespoke thing because like if you draw something, you know, you're an architect, you know, this is how they're going to build it. They never build it that way, right? Because you can do, talk to five contractors and they'll do it all completely differently, right? So if, it's, if you didn't pick the way he, that guy does it, it's going to be more expensive because he doesn't understand it. The key is sort of the dialogue you have pre-bid with those contractors because 
Like we did a building that it was a cheap, really cheap building, had all exposed conduit up the main corner of the building all the way up. And I'm like, look, how do you guys do this? What's the rules that we could follow? And he said, look, if you do these three things, we'll do it exactly the way you draw. So we did dimension conduit drawings, right? It's crazy. But because he, we talked to him, he's like, no, I got three, four grand bins like this. You know, this is how my guys work. So because we understood that, there was no cost. And they built, it's beautiful, right? It's like a piece of art. So I think that, um, I think BIM is helping that, that issue. Like we're working on a project right now of an office renovation where we're chopping up this existing uh, 80s office building. And that contractor has our BIM model and is doing takeoffs while we're, you know, we're shipping them a new model every week. So in that sense, it, the fluidity of that is getting much better. So he's actually going kind to of come into our office and do like a lunchtime seminar about how they use BIM. Because like architects, like I'm the worst at BIM, right? I got to make sure it works from a, 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 not necessarily what all the product data is, right? So everybody in my office hates me when I'm like in the model, right? It's like, why is this thing a curtain wall? It, you know, it's a toilet. You know, like it's just crazy stuff that gets across, you know, it's this floor-based hosted thing when it should have been, you know, but, but I think that we as architects got to understand how the industry uses a, a model better to be more fluid because I agree, like, the future is that, and if architects aren't careful, they won't be a part of that future. Did you say who the structural engineer was on the Evo? Uh, Thornton Thomas Setti. Very good engineer. Very good engineer. All right. Well, Scott, thank you very much. Thank you. So good. Thank you. This building. The state of his will.